911, what's your emergency? Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the PIO Podcast, a place to discuss all public information related topics for police, fire, EMS, and local and federal government organizations. It was a good learning experience for a lot of us that, that social media is not real life. But we have to remember the media are very rarely a target audience. They're simply that conduit. I think what's so interesting about this position too and this job and this profession is that um, every one of us is looking for purpose. And when we find it here, that's it. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Robert Tornabeni. I am a public information officer with over 27 years of law enforcement background. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Want to level up your comm skill? Find it hard to get in-person training or get the budget? Our academy has content for every type of PIO, created by PIOs. Affordable and flexible, you're sure to find the course for you. Subscribe now by heading to www.piotoolkit.com and find your next career development opportunity. Welcome to retired NYPD detective, Tom Verne. Tom, welcome to the show. Good evening. How are we doing today? I'm doing great. We're doing uh, very good, and I hope you are doing well, too. Tom, before we get into the questions, let's talk about your background. So you uh, you had a 22-year career with NYPD? Correct. And and, and what, what did you do while you were with NYPD? Uh, let's see. What didn't I do? <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, so uh, starting out, I, I did patrol. I did uniform patrol. Uh, did some plain clothes in our uh, what we call conditions units as well as anti-crime units and on a precinct level uh, so i got a pretty wide variety of, of stuff i learned from that uh, i wound up on my way to trying to get into the warrant squad uh they hooked me into the uh, into the academy to become an instructor which i wasn't planning on doing for for quite a while after but um because the the career track i was looking to take was was to become a detective and uh, subsequently, uh, at some point, get involved in hate crimes investigations, which I wound up doing anyway. And then, uh, and then, try to get also a foot into what's uh, a PIO would, and then the NYPD would be someone who works in what's called DCPI, it's the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information. So at some point, I was actually cross trained to do that as well. Um, Later on, after the after being a, an academy instructor and uh, and then working for one of the citywide chiefs for community affairs and crime prevention, one of the 16 jobs I had was that I would work with a, a number of crime victim agencies not as a liaison. So what would happen is someone would call me from one of these uh, crime victim agencies and say, hey, you know, we had someone who was uh, victimized, they were beaten up, they were robbed or whatever it was. Uh, and, and they would kind of shunt uh, anything that was hate crimes or bias related. Uh, that's, that's what I would catch. So I would be the intermediary uh, with the crime victim who either called the police and the cops showed up and didn't do anything because uh, that never happens. Right. <laughs> or, uh, you know, or uh, they hadn't called the police and this incident may have occurred 24 hours or 24 days ago. And then I would have to first take the initial uh, complaint report as well as maybe some other, you know, uh, aided report if they were injured and so forth, and then walk that into a precinct and speak to a desk officer and let them know this, you know, this flaming bag of dog do the half, you know, uh, and then and then subsequently that would get walked up right to the squad, and then the squad initially uh, it, it inevitably would call the hate crimes task force, which is a specific group of detectives that investigate nothing but hate crimes. Uh, but when you're investigating hate crimes, uh, hate crimes is a pretty broad umbrella, right? Because that could encompass an assault. It could encompass a robbery. It could encompass a home invasion. It could encompass a murder. Uh, and, you know, there were a couple of cases that I worked on with a couple of homicide squads, one of which was someone who was attacked in Brooklyn back in 2006. That's, that was kind of a, a case that was, you know, uh, 
there were some detectives who have, you know, I guess a watershed case, if you will. And that was a case that got particularly well known because it, it echoed a, a racial bias case that had happened 20 years prior in the, in the same vicinity. And uh, this case was similar in, in many respects, but then it turned out it was a uh, not so much an anti-Black uh, bias crime as it was an anti-gay bias crime. So um, years later, you know, uh, uh, when I retired and I started doing some media work, um, Investigation Discovery Channel, as well as uh, a, a TV One, had reached out to do a, uh, a biopic on that particular case as well. Uh, it fit into one of the series that they were uh, doing at the time. So you know, they interviewed me for that as well. So yeah, I had a pretty wide variety of jobs while I was there. Um, I, I, I loved the job, uh, but after 22 years, you know, coming up on my 22nd anniversary, it was I felt like I didn't really have much left in the tank. And um, you know, and it was just time. Everyone that who you know retires can uh, probably uh, associate with this. And it's you know, you just get that feeling that it's just time to go and move on and do something else. You know, and that's what I did. Absolutely. I can completely understand that. And so, so Tom, you are, um, you were a liaison specifically for the, the, the lesbian, gay, transgender population, correct for NYPD. And, correct. and, and you're, you're, you you were openly gay at the time. That's what my husband says. <laughs> I, so I, we, we do trainings in the, uh, in the NYPD. As a matter of fact, I still do the trainings with the Nassau County, police department out here in, in Long Island and uh, their, their LGBTQ training. And, you know, uh, what I explained to them is that I'm not a lesbian, I'm, I'm not transgender. Uh, so I can, I can speak to what we've been trained on in the NYPD uh, of those aspects of, of, of those communities. And what we try to provide, uh, the training that, that I've tried to provide over the years is, is kind of a foundational understanding um, to a community that uh, a lot of people have have varying states of, of feelings about, right? So some people don't care, you know. Some people, you know, let, let, let you know, live your life and, and let you know, let it be. Uh, some people, because of uh, maybe some sort of religious or or ethnic or uh, general ways that they were brought up, to believe that there's something wrong with those people. Uh, you know, I, I don't like their lifestyle, and it's against my religion or it's against my moral code or whatever it may be. And then when you talk about you know the transgender community and and, and the concept of gender identity, and it introduces a whole other you know world of of question marks to people who who don't have the knowledge. Um, so at the end of the training, you know, what we try to do is is to leave people with less questions than what they had when you first walk in there. And I'm just a a, a transmitter of information, right? So I'm not trying to you know, I'm not trying to force anyone to suddenly go out and, and hug the first transgender person they see, uh, or the first lesbian they see, or the first gay man they see. Uh, but they hopefully will at least understand why someone is maybe, uh, you know, uh, either looks different than they do, or has a different relationship than they do, or their gender is a different status than theirs is, because maybe they've never been exposed to that before, right? Uh, you know, or maybe they haven't, they just don't, there's still something that doesn't sit right with them. So the, the training is designed to kind of break down a lot of barriers. And, uh, and you know, I, again, I'm just coming in with information and people will take whatever they've heard up until that point, they'll process all this new information and then come out with perhaps a different opinion than what they did when they first walked in. And I'm not forcing anyone to change their opinion. Um, I'm forcing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to force people to think a little bit more than they did before, especially police officers who have to interact with this community. And in some states, you know, there may be laws, uh, you know, still that exist when it, when it comes to LGBT rights, uh, you know, so, and then those officers have to now provide a service to this community like they would any other community without treating them like second class citizens. And, uh, and, and that kind of goes the, to the whole way policing should do is we should just treat everybody as human beings. And not, and not see race and not see sex and not see color and ethnicity and all those things. If they come to us, they're coming to us for help. And that's our job to help them. So if we just look at it from that perspective of here's a human being, I'm a human being and they need help and yeah. it's my job to help them. That solves the problem. Correct. 
Yeah. And, and I, you know, unfortunately there were a number of times when I was uh, acting as a liaison where I would get called, you know, to one of these agencies and they, they would tell me about a scenario where they uh, were attacked uh, and they called the police, the police showed up and they couldn't be bothered. They couldn't, you know, and, and everyone, you know, everyone in the policing business knows what nonsense is, right? You respond to something and it's nonsense and, and nonsense is nonsense. Uh, but when you respond to an incident where someone's been attacked, especially if they've been attacked because of who they are, or who they were perceived to be, you know, a little light bulb needs to go off in, in the back of someone's head and says to say, All right, this is not nonsense. This is an assault, uh, assault with an injury. You know, in some states they call it assault with a battery. Um, and then, you know, provide some level of service to them, get them medical attention, you know, take a report, try to find out who did this, or if it was a group of people that did this, maybe now it's also a gang assault on top of it. You know, you want to catch these people that have, that go out and commit these types of crimes against other people, because at the end of the day, almost like a sexual assault, this is something that that person will never forget because it strikes at the very core of who they are as a person. You know, whether they were attacked because they were white or black or Hispanic or Jewish or Muslim or you know gay or lesbian or transgender, they're being attacked because of who they are and they can't change who they are, right? So you know, if we have people running around our society that have that much of a problem with somebody because of their race or their gender identity or their sexual orientation or their religion or something else, maybe even their political views for that matter in, in the times we're living in, you know, those people need to talk about those issues in jail not going around making other members of our society feel unsafe in their own skin and, and, and walking in their, own, in their own neighborhoods. That's just not, that's just crazy that someone would feel that way. Absolutely. So Tom, what, what can agencies do to increase the connection to the, of the members of the community who feel isolated or marginalized, particularly from the police department? Well, I think, you know, what we've, what we've come across at least here in New York city is that, the, the NYPD uh, has become much more of a diverse department than it was when I came into it in 1992. Uh, in 1992, in the early 90s, you know, the, the, you know, the NYPD was still largely you know, male, white, heterosexual dominated police department. There were females, there were uh, members of uh, people of color in the police department. There were some gay and lesbian officers. Uh, but it wasn't until like the mid to late 90s into the early 2000s that they really start to recruit from within the neighborhoods in which they were serving. And not to say that if you came, if you were an officer who came in from outside of New York City, from Long Island or upstate in you know, Westchester County, Rockland County, that you were a bad police officer. I grew up in Long Island. Uh, you know, so I, I think there are some people that feel like you have to do that. You should do that and and exclude people from outside the city. I don't think that's that's the way to go. I think that attempting to, uh, you know, to recruit from as many communities as possible to, especially in New York City, where you, we have eight to 10 million people that you're policing every day. And if you count the commuters, probably about 12 or 13 million people, commuters and vacationers. So that's a lot of people to police with only 35,000 cops. And when people start to see the police department as representative of who they are, they're gonna feel more comfortable coming to the police with their problems. And that's what happened during the 1990s. One of the main things that, that drove crime down was that the police and the community started to come together through different programs, but more importantly, through a better understanding of one another, where they didn't feel so apprehensive to come to us with information. Because that's who's the, who the eyes and ears are. When you and I turn the corner and we're, we're patrolling another block, that's who's out there, the people who live there. And they know what's right and what's wrong in, in the community. And they're the ones that are going to be feeding us the information. So I think that, you know, the, the but to, to get to that point, you know, police departments have to do, have to continually uh, finesse that relationship, right? Uh, they have to continually come out with programs that will bring the communities and, and most importantly, the kids, young kids, especially kids who are old enough to get into gangs, you know, try to keep them within arm's reach of, of, of the police so they feel more comfortable being around us and, and talking to us and letting us know what's going on. That that's how crime reduction works. Is when you have the community involved, you know, with with the police department helping us out, and not on on two sides of you know different sides of a barrier screaming at one another. Right. And and in this day and age, we are. It is so, especially this time in the in in our country, 
screaming at each other is the way to go, and whoever screams loudest is the one that wins. And it's un- it's very unfortunate. So, Tom, I saw I read an article or saw an interview that you did where you had a you were talking about conversations about bias and implicit bias and it being important to changing the perception of police. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? So I, I don't think it's um, a foregone, I think it's a foregone conclusion that we, we could all agree that we've all been raised with some sort of bias, right? Um, because that's how we've been socialized, you know, through, again, through either family or we've grown up or through friends or with the education you received or just messages that we've received through the media, you know, from the time that we were infants. You know, we have grown up to believe certain things about certain groups of people. Um, And I think we all know that the media, you know, depending on which media you're talking about, they all have their own angle uh, into, into, you know, how we are, what information we are given and, uh, and, and how, you know, that information is given to us in a way that we, you know, absorb it and then, and make some kind of sense of it, right? Whether you talk about right leaning media or left leaning media. So, you know, uh, with, you know, undoing biases is, is, is a lifelong journey, I think, for, for just about everybody, uh, because it's, it's taking all of this stuff that's, that's been kind of driven into us over the years, over decades, and, and trying to you know, extrapolate it and figure out whether or not is this piece of information that I know about this group right or wrong, and why is it right or wrong, and how do I reconfigure my opinion and the way I present myself to those people uh, in the most positive and productive way, right? Some people are just like, you know what the hell with it? I don't, I don't, I don't have anything to do with that. I don't like those people. <laughs> anyone anyone from that group is just going to get the, the same basic middle finger treatment from me, whether they like it or not. I, I don't care. I need to get along with these people. And, that, and that's their prerogative. But, uh, you know, as a country, you know, uh, uh, when you when you talk about you know being a United States, I mean you that's kind of something I think that's been lost, especially over the last you know number of years, where we've become a divided states of America, um, and that and it because we've allowed we collectively have allowed ourselves to fall into this trap of of I think relying a little too much on on what the media feeds us, and uh, allowing divisions to, to break out over differences, you know, whether it's a difference in income, whether it's a difference in race or a difference in political views. Um, you know, I, listen, I, I was raised, uh, as a, as a moderate Democrat. Um, I, I, I'm kind of firmly, I think, entrenched in that. I've, uh, there are times over the years where I was going to, you know, uh, come over to be a, a Republican and, and whether I was a Republican or, de- or a Democrat, I think the, the my core values sit firmly in, in a moderate state. You know, I think when it comes to uh, social issues, yeah, you know, do I lean more on the left side? Yes. Uh, when it comes to more of uh, uh, you know supporting military and our veterans and police and law and order, do I lean more right? Absolutely. You know, uh, but I, I think you know, that I've had to even myself. You know, when it comes to people who are on the far right or on the far left. There was a time, I guess, you know, in the last few years in particular, where I would catch myself, uh, where one side or the other would say something, and I and I would just in, almost immediately start to dismiss it, and then catch myself and say, "Wait a minute, wait, let's not do that. Let's just let me hear them out. Let me let me see what they're what they're trying to get at, what their point is, and then you know, and then we can we can talk about it. because at the end of the day, quite frankly, there's no. There's no politician on a, on a local, state, or federal level that really, I think, gives a rat's ass about you or me. No, um, it's all yeah. about reelection. And you know, what? <laughs> yeah. interesting thing, I saw, I saw like a thing today on TikTok about this, of why the the um, there's a flat line when it comes to um, getting things done in the government, and mm-hmm. so you have on on a graph. If you had a graph, and on the graph you had uh, the people that wanted something done and then the likelihood that it would get done on the other side. And you had a straight line at the 30% that you had a 30% chance. If you had a lot of people getting something that wanting to get it done versus just a few people wanting to get something done, 
it was still 30 percent because the other 70 percent of the time, the politicians were spending all their time and effort to get themselves reelected for the next term. So there was never any chance of ever ever getting anything done because the politician's whole job is to remain a politician, not to actually get things done, because if it was like it was. 200 years ago, you did it for a couple of years and then you went back to your, your, your private business or whatever, right. right, Or your farm. Exactly. Now it's a whole occupation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what, and if, if someone wants to become a career politician, you know, I I don't know if I necessarily have a problem with that. If, if they work and they actually do something, you know, if they do make some sort of substantial change for the better, um, whatever that is, you know, whatever the topic might be. So, you know, it, it, it's what, I mean, this, this could be a whole of 10 shows, but I mean, you know, here in New York city, you know, the, New York city has a, has a way at least recently of, of electing people that, uh, are just looking for the next stepping stone and don't do anything. And actually not, not only don't do anything, but make things worse you know, and, and leave things in, in worship than what they found them in. You know, in, in the case of, you know, the recent uh, Mayor de Blasio that New York City had, which he ran his whole campaign anti-police, anti-NYPD, got elected because there was really no one substantial running on the other side against him, which is a whole other conversation to have, you know, if you're a Republican in, in New York, in New York City, uh, why can't you conjure up someone who's, who's formidable, uh, especially against someone like him? And especially since after four years of, of disaster, he got reelected again, you know, because there was no one really, he was running almost unopposed. And, there's a uh, similar, there's a similar model in Chicago where they do the same thing. Oh my God. I have a friend of mine who lives in Chicago and they, 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 they love this. They love their city. I, uh, yeah. Resistant to leave because they, there's this eternal hope that things will get better. Meanwhile, this this weekend, I think there were five dozen people that got shot and and almost a dozen people killed. I, I just don't, yeah, you know, because it's just this never ending, you know, gun violence that goes on there that goes on almost unchecked. And the mayor thinks that she's doing a great job. And the, oh yeah, and, the and they'll reelect her. <laughs> right, I just I just I just don't understand. <laughs> New York, Chicago, very a lot of similarities, you know, at least recently when it comes to that, I, it just blows my mind. We need to take a break right now so we can take care of some business. Visit go.lawpublications.net forward slash law digital to schedule a free demo. And now back to the show. All right. So let me throw this question at you. So in the news recently in Alaska, a a police officer stopped someone for traffic, a traffic violation. And the woman showed their white privilege card um, on the way to a Trump rally. <laughs> the officer is now facing discipline now for the actions because he let the person go yeah. and took a photograph. And I think it got published on one of the social media platforms. How, how should have the officers have handled that situation differently? Well, I mean, you know, we all know that we have some level of autonomy, uh, autonomy to to be out there doing what we're doing, right? Uh, we do have discretion that we can use. I think, you know, it, it. some officers don't, I think, think a little bit before they act as far as what will the fallout be from their actions, right? And we see this all the time. We, we see this constantly. I mean, there were like seven to 800,000 law enforcement people in, in this country. Um, you know, so... There are always going to be those who are doing things that are unscrupulous. There are going to be those who are trying to get over on the system and game the system. Uh, there are going to be those who are not policing with, with the, the best intentions in mind. Uh, there are going to be those who are just unbelievably racist, you know, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, and what have you. And then there are going to be those who just make s- kind of silly mistakes, you know. Um, I think that, and, and that's something that we try to, that I've tried to, relate over the years, especially as, you know, technology has evolved. You know, in 1992, we didn't have these, you know, and what I've tried to explain to my, my recruits that I've had in the past, 
And this is when, you know, cell phones first came out and they were like these bricks, you know, with the, the big antenna on them and then the flip phones and the flip phones could take pictures. And, you know, I, I'm not a technologist, you know, but I tried to explain to these recruits that what I do know about technology is that technology continues to advance. And, and eventually these phones, they're taking pictures now, eventually they'll probably take movies, you know, or, or video. And, and that's exactly what's happening. So you could, you could now record a full length movie on these things. And everything that you say and everything that you do will be used against you uh, in the court of law or in the court of public opinion. You know, and, and you know, public perception is nine tenths of the law nowadays anyway. So, you know, you have to understand that, you know, every, and now, especially in, in the departments that have body cams, you know, I, I, you know, I was a little concerned when, when the body cams first came out. I said, but my, my gut feeling is that in the end, it will probably save more cops and it hurts because with the amount of uh, fake complaints, you know, or, or you know, uh, untrue un complaints that police get across the country, especially in New York City, that once you have the body cam on, it shows exactly the actions you took and, and what you said and how you handled it. It will exonerate more cops than, than it will convict. And that's kind of what's been happening. Um, yeah. Are there cops getting caught up in stuff and getting fired and, and or put in jail? Yeah. Uh, but then if they've probably gone off the rails and done something, you know, really idiotic to, to, to warrant that, you know, to, to warrant that. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, what officers during tra traffic stops, domestic violence calls, really anything at this point, they have to be mindful of, of how they're treating people. Uh, and is that treatment, you know, is it uh, disparate in some way towards others or are you treating everyone even handedly where everyone's getting the same treatment? Yeah, you know, and then I think that's where usually most cops get themselves into trouble is when they do the, the extra thing to you know to get somebody out of trouble that they thought oh it was neat. Yeah. Well, you you can't make it public then either if you're going to do that because it's only going to hurt you in the exactly. long run. Exactly. Yeah. So you just have to think about the again just double and triple think about sometimes. If I put this out there, especially if you put it on social media, you know, which is another is a whole other thing that we didn't have to worry about. For those of us that came on the job, you know, before social media was around, um, you know, because back then, you know, because someone could say, "Oh, well, I remember when you did that thing," and and the only way they could prove it is if they had a Polaroid. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, nah, you're recorded doing some kind of crazy thing, and it's all over, you know, Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or whatever it may be. And if and if you're going to put that stuff out there, you have to realize that there's there's ramifications of of that, right? Uh, it, it may not be perceived the way that you think it's going to be perceived in, in a positive way, there may be a whole other cast of characters that are going to perceive that in, in a very different way. And it's something that could come back to bite. There's so many ways for them to come at you at this point. You have to be really, really careful in, in what, what you're doing out there. Absolutely. All right. So let me throw this one at you. You, you had made a comment that policing right now is, is the hardest it's ever mm -hmm. been. And we've kind of talked about it, but can you add a little bit more context yeah. to it? So when I came into the NYPD in 1992, there were about 2,000 people a year being killed in New York City. Uh, I, I mean, crack was all over the place. Gangs were, were you know, were flourishing. Uh, the mafia was still, you know, in, in business uh, at a pretty high level. And so the danger factor, uh, in my opinion, was the general danger factor was greater back then as far as crime is concerned because clearly crime was much higher in every category uh, across the board. So, so some people might think, well, that was really that was probably the most dangerous time to be, you know, a police officer. And, and I'm not saying it wasn't; it, it certainly was. Nowadays, because of, of what we just talked about with the advent of, you know, uh, camera phones and social media and and uh, so many levels of oversight you know, with police, that it's, you know, a police officer from 30 or 40 or 50 years ago couldn't say or do a fraction of the things that they did back then today, right? And, you know, some of them might be good as far as in the sense that if they were doing something illegal, if they were doing something, excuse me, if they were a little heavy handed in their, in their you know, treatment of people, you know, uh, then as, if, in, as far as really abusive, I'm saying not, you know, so listen, somebody punches you in the face, then you should be using all the force necessary to get that person 
you know, uh, under under arrest. So that that, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't change. But you know, uh, when it comes to being able to uh, to ad lib, you know, and say whatever you like to say to try to get a situation under control, you know, that that's gonna that is gonna come back to haunt you almost instantaneously if that gets out into social media nowadays. So, and for people who are, you know, uh, public information officers who now have to take a scenario that's, that's currently blowing up in, in that, that apartment and try to uh, justify that or put some sort of message out as to why that happened and how that falls in line with the department mission and standards and, and you know, and within the confines of their patrol guide uh, or their rule book. It, it makes it a lot harder, right? You know, um, so I, again, I, I I constantly tell these, you know, the, the recruits that I that I uh, speak to from time to time, you still have to be careful just as much as you did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, another thing that's changed now that was a little bit different from, from back then as well is that people will not hesitate to come at you uh, nowadays. People will not hesitate to roll around with you on the floor, or try to go for your gun or, and or get your gun and use it against you. Uh, there are a lot more people walking around armed now than I think than there ever have, have been before, uh, whether it be legally or illegally, and especially illegally, as, as we you know talked about in the case of like a Chicago. Um, so you know the, the danger factor is there, and and the the ability to get you know hung up on on something you may have said that may have come out in a fit of anger, right? Uh, to, Come back to bite you and the proverbial ass is, is greater and also quite frankly uh politically you know in some towns you may have a uh you know a mayor or you know uh, a governor or congress people that that stand that back the police uh and and will call for calm and, and wait for you know the facts and evidence to come out and, and play out one way or the other and in some cases you have those who will jump on the you know up on the soapbox looking to make a, a greater name for themselves, not really all that interested in the facts and evidence, but want to get people kind of you know whipped up and, and, and wild up because it's it's all about them and not so much about the facts, right? So, um, and that presents a whole other host of issues. So whether or not you have you know a strong political backing or not is, is important. And in a lot of these bigger cities like New York, like Chicago, like Baltimore, um, you don't have that. You know, unfortunately you have cowards uh, running these cities that are more interested in, in trying to make something a name for themselves to get to their next stepping stone versus even worrying about you know the, the people in the city and and not getting them involved in something that that's not necessary as far as you know some you know creating some sort of inciting almost a riot if you will right right all right so todd you you are frequently called in by journalists cnn and 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 the other news agencies, CBS and so on, to come and talk on law enforcement issues, and, and you're regularly on there. What mistakes do you see that PIOs make when they're talking on camera in an interview? So, um, so what happened was after so I retired at the end of 2013. Into 2014, we had a couple of uh, big uh, police involved incidents. One was uh, Ferguson. And the other was Eric Garner in Staten Island, and that one obviously hit home because it happened in, in police department that I wish that I had just left. And I, um, over the years, working with our media unit, had made a lot of connections uh, in the media. So uh, I had a connection with the local Fox affiliate in New York, Fox Five. And when all that was happening, uh, I, I was talking to uh, one of the producers there and so why you know why is this how why is this happening why did ferguson happen and why did eric garner happen and why did they choke him to death and i was trying to explain that they didn't purposely choke him to death and and you know that started out as the way you know the, it unfolded the way it did and then they used physical force to try to get him uh, get him under arrest and then and all that and then uh so i said you know there's there's a lack of understanding as to why or as to what police do right uh, there was a point where I was in the academy. We would teach a, a citizens police academy class. It was a thirteen week class. People come in three nights, uh, three hours a night, uh, one night a week for for thirteen weeks. They would get a crash course in what police training is, uh, what's involved in police training, at least on some of the bigger topics. Uh, you know, emotionally disturbed people, domestic violence, 
you know, internal affairs would come in and, and, and give a spiel about what they do, um, you know, crime prevention, uh, counterterrorism, and so forth. They would go, you know, go through the, uh, the fat simulator and go through the, the firing uh, simulator with, with using a, a firearm. So the good thing about that is that we wouldn't look for the people who were waving, you know, the blue line flag. We were looking for people who hated the police. <laughs> we wanted, you know, the Al Sharptons and, and, and those kinds of people that always have some sort of an issue with the police, but yet don't take the time out to understand what goes into policing and how, what it really takes. So when, when these incidents occur and you, you know, uh, in my opinion, what happens many times. So when I get called out to these, these, these shows, whether it be Fox or Fox business news or, or CNN or uh, MSNBC, whatever it may be, I don't, I don't work in these places. Right. So I could potentially call those departments, which many times I've done and speaking, uh, spoken to a, a PIO or a media uh, unit there and say, Hey, you know, uh, Fox is asking me to come on or CNN is asking me to come on and talk about what happened in your, in your department. Uh, is there anything you are able to release to give me a better understanding of that? And they don't have to release anything to me. They don't know who I am, but I'm, I'm, in order to be the advocate, right. On behalf of the police, I also, you know, I'm working with the same facts that have give, been given to the, you know, the general public. So, um, you know, and some of them do, and, and some say, you know, we can't do that. And, that, and that's fine. I understand it's an active investigation, so I'm not uh, assuming that will happen. But what I've seen happen on, on a few occasions, or a number of occasions, I guess, is that while the the idea is to be as transparent as possible, right, because people like transparency, they don't want smoke and mirrors, they don't want to be treated like children, they don't want to be uh, treated like like idiots. So they want their police departments to be transparent we have to do an active investigation and that takes time right it takes a long time depending on how crazy the scenario was it takes a long time sometimes um but as long as you know the pios are as transparent as they could possibly be but what's important is that you don't want to release you know uh certain bits of information that could jeopardize the investigation as well right that's a huge that's probably the number one thing i think pios have to constantly worry about am i going to release something that I shouldn't, oops, I shouldn't have said that kind of a thing, right? Um, that's, a, you know, an incident commander's greatest you know, fear, I think, is the PIO releasing something that they shouldn't have. And or uh, more importantly, because of it potentially jeopardizing the investigation more than anything else, right? So I think that's probably the number one thing is that sometimes they will, some departments will try to quickly put together something to appease the media and try to get something out there. And they don't have, I think, enough facts yet to really give a, 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 a solid, you know, uh, story as to, as to what took place there. And in some cases, uh, you know, I think that they were treading on the lines of whether or not they were going to release something that they shouldn't have. And because, look, the, the media is always going to be there. You, know, you set up a media pen, you know, the trucks are going to come, the attendants are going to go up, they're not going anyplace. So I think it's it, it's it's okay to take that extra bit of time. You know, you can feed the media. Uh, sort of, listen, we are going to have, you know, we're going to have a press conference. Our intention was to have it at six o'clock tonight, but you know what? We need to gather some more information, so we'll have it at nine a.m. tomorrow. Take the extra time, do the extra footwork. You, you know, you're buying yourself the extra time to get that information you need, to give yourself a better picture as to what took place there. Um, and unless you know, if we're looking for someone who just you know, kill the police officer, that might be the only information that I would want to get out there, you know, as, as far as the description is concerned. And if you're going to release any video in relation to that, yeah, that might be, because that, that's something that, you know, we want to get a hold of that person quickly before they flee the country. Uh, you know, so that that's about the only time I think I would rush to get something out for the sake of the safety of other officers in that area or in that state or somewhere else for that matter that, that, that you know, fellow may be fleeing to. Uh, other than that, when it comes to everything else, I, I, I think it's, you know, I think time, you know, use the time that you have to your advantage and kind of pick and choose your battles when it, when it comes to, you know, dealing with the media. Okay, that's good. I, you know what, I like that because I think a lot of PIOs are, are they want to rush to get the information out because they, they, they know that they've got to feed the animal yeah. when it comes to the media. But we work on our timeline because... I, that's the way we have sure. to work. 
and we can't work on the news cycle or the you know the ten o'clock, the six o'clock, five o'clock news. We have to work on the what we have. So whether you put out a holding statement and you say uh, we're we're not ready to release a uh, information, you know, about this whole incident. However, this is the subject we're looking for. We do not think he's a threat to the community. Blah blah blah. Whatever it might be. But at least you're giving them a little something and you're going to say, well, we'll talk more later on and give you more details. Yeah. And you know what? And and you don't want to worry people, right? So, it, it, but on the flip side, if you have someone who is armed and dangerous and an, and an immediate threat to the community, I mean, quite frankly, I that's something that you know, some people are a little apprehensive to put that out uh, and say, uh, you know, that, you know, this person is a danger to the community or he's not a danger to the community and i mean if he is he is you know or she for that matter uh if, if they if they are a threat if they are an immediate armed threat to to the surrounding area or the, maybe even the the larger you know if we want to throw out a bigger um you know uh blanket then then it is what it is you want to make sure that people can best prepare themselves you don't want to because again in that, in that respect if you have someone who's psychotic and now has done something insane uh mass shooting for instance you, know, you don't want to put something out there saying, well, you know, this person's not a threat to the general community. Well, no, someone that goes into a school and, and shoots, you know, 19 fourth graders and a couple of teachers, that that's a that's a threat. It's that's a threat. You know I mean, that, yeah. that's no, no, that that person is a threat until we know that person is no longer a threat. So, yeah, I would take precautions if you are in the surrounding hundred mile radius of this shooting. You know, I would stay in your homes. You know, I would if you're in a school, you, you want to go on lockdown until further notice. That's why we have these things in place now is, is, is for crazy incidents like that. Again, you don't want to give people a stroke. So you have to kind of be careful in the way that you word it and the way that you present it. Right. Uh, but yet it, it is what it is. And if because let's say for argument's sake, you put something out and say, oh, this person is an, an immediate threat that we're aware of. And now they go and, and shoot another half dozen people. Now what do you got? And now you're going to have right. them like look and rip your head off. You right. I mean? so, you're covered something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You lied to us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I agree. All right, Tom, let's go to uh, some rapid fire questions here, real quick. Uh, texting or talking? I like talking. Uh, place you most want to travel to? Italy. Again. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Uh, neither. Drink of choice. Arnold Palmer. <laughs> Invisibility or super strength? I think super strength. A must read book. Oh boy, that's a good one. Um, that's a good one. Let me get back to that one. <laughs> okay. Name something you would eat for a week straight. Chocolate. All right. All right, Tom. So uh, last question, ask for permission or beg for forgiveness? I would say ask for, for permission. What would we say? Okay. Okay. Everybody's 50-50 <laughs> yeah. on that one. It's never on one side. I like that. All right, Tom. So what would you like key takeaways? What's a key takeaway that uh, a PIO can take from our conversation today? Key takeaway. Um, I would say instead of... My my experience with a lot of PIOs is that many of them will see the media as an enemy. Um, I I think the to maybe take a little look at that and and say that the media can be used as a tool, um, another tool in your toolbox to accomplish whatever the mission happens to be. So if your department is one that's had a few incidents where you know the, the community is kind of up in arms and you know, uh, or frustrated with you or they hate you, uh, you know, if you are devising some sort of uh, outreach to the community, some sort of positive or productive outreach, you know, this, to not call the media would just be a wasted opportunity. Uh, you know, and, and the NYPD has done that numerous, numerous times where they've come out with some sort of program to and put that out into the media to make sure that the media floods at least the local airwaves so people hear about it. They hear about it either on AM news radio or they hear about it you know, on their local five, six or 10 o'clock you know, news report. Um, right. So use the media, I think, as, as a tool for good. Um, and 
you know, to, to double and triple check what you put out there uh, so it doesn't come back to bite you in the ass. Thank you. Anything you'd like to add, Tom? Anything I'd like to add? Um, not, I, not that I could think of other than I, I, I really hope that, uh, you know, I, I feel for those who are still out there active uh, and know that there are those of us who are fortunate to have an occasional, uh, the occasional ability to, to, to you know, get into some of these news organizations and to advocate on, on your behalf. Uh, it does make it a lot easier when, when things have been done, you know, according to procedure and, and, and by the law, um, you know, but I, 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 you know, like I've been there for a number of departments at this point over the last, you know, eight years, uh, you know, trying to put the message out there that uh, for everyone to kind of just stop and take a step back and try to get as much facts and evidence when, when a, a scenario, you know, happens and to not rush in and immediately, uh, you know, try to poke the bear and, 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 and make the cops out to be the bad guys. Because more times than not, they're not. And, you know, they've, they're doing their jobs, uh, you know, and, and, and in most cases they're doing them correctly they're doing it really well. Uh, the, and that is continually, we're continually reminded of that in the blood that's spilled on, on behalf of law enforcement people around the country. And, um, you know, so I, I think if people really have that much of a problem with, with the local police department, the local cops, I think it'd be good even for them to take the initiative to try to see if there's some way that they can learn more about them. Uh, maybe see if there's something they, they could do. If they haven't reached out, then maybe you can, you know, egg them on to, to reach out and, 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 you know, get, get together with the community to, to have a better understanding. So, uh, you know, patience is a virtue and, and, you know, we need a hundred times more patience now than I think that we ever needed before to do. To do I job. agree. I agree. Tom, how can people best reach out to you if they want to connect or follow up in anything that you've said or or just connect with you, period? Uh, email. You can get me at uh, Tom at TomVerney.com, T-O-M-V-E-R-N-I.com, or at Tom Verney on Twitter are the two easiest ways. And I will add all that into the show notes. Excellent. Tom, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. You've been a wealth of knowledge. And, uh, I, you know, I always love the content you put out and and your interviews and stuff so it's it's just been a wonderful opportunity to interview thank you for coming i appreciate you having me on anytime and that's tom verney from nypd retired detective after 22 years thank you for your service thank you sir law publications is your department's one-stop solution for quality resources to amplify your community outreach efforts. Our product catalog includes books, flyers, coloring books, social media assets, and swag, giving your team the variety of tools they need to respond to any situation. Best of all, our books are customizable with your department's name and or program is free of charge to departments through support from your local business community, helping to connect your department's work within your community. Visit go.lawpublications.net forward slash podcast to learn more about our products and process today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified of the latest episode. If you are listening on a platform that allows reviews, please give us a review. We appreciate any review, good or bad. It helps us improve on each episode. Until next time. Be safe.